could start now. We've got 70 people in the room. So thank you very much. So um, I'll introduce myself and I'll hand over to Janine and then um, Janine will hand back to me and, and I'll say a bit more about the special issue. Um, and indeed, um, Eleanor has confirmed that she is on a train. So well remembered, Janine. So I'm Louise Ryan, as I've said, and um, along with Janine, I was very, very happy to have co-edited this special issue of the journal Global Networks. And I don't think I need to say much more about myself right now because I'll, I'll say a bit more later. So I'll now hand over to Professor Janine de Hinden. So hi, everyone. I actually just uh, wanted to say a very warm welcome from my side. I'm in Switzerland and I'm very happy that Louise and her institute is hosting this event. And I'm really happy to see you all there and the kind of celebrate with us this, what I would call vernissage of our special issue. I don't know if you have this tradition at the places where you are, but vernissage is in Switzerland. We do actually for books and in libraries. But I think given these special times, we might change a little bit the signification of the word of, of uh, vernissage and uh, we can bring it online and we can do it in view of the special issue, which was such a pleasure to, to do and to work with all these authors and to collaborate with Louise. And I'm, I'm really happy that we, we have this kind of lounge event, this vernissage, as I would call. So a warm welcome from my side. And please, Louise. Yes, thanks very much, Janine. So I'm going to introduce the special issue and uh, many of the authors are with us here today, but they're not all here. So we wanted to make sure that we gave uh, recognition to the authors who couldn't be here today for various reasons. So I'm going to try and share my screen just so I don't forget anybody. Um, I will, I always get confused now when I'm sharing my screen. So what do I need to open? Share files. Um, and then if I add a file, I should have tried this beforehand. Oh, I've already opened it. It's on the desktop. You, all, you get to see all my files now. So this would be potentially very embarrassing. Uh, I should have done this while Janine was speaking. Oh, is it not going to work? No, OK, that's not going to work. So I'm just going to have to read out uh, documents, maybe downloads. No, OK, not going to work. So I'll just open the screen myself and I will um, read them out. So this is um, a special issue of Global Networks, and we are delighted to be able to present many of the papers here today. But I just want to very quickly run through um, all of the articles and you can see all of these on the Global Networks um, website. So the first article was the introduction that Janine and I worked on together, which is qualitative network analysis for migration studies. And that really highlighted the two key themes that we wanted to talk about in the special issue and which we will also be talking about this evening, beyond metaphors and the epistemological pitfalls that we think have been a feature of migration studies and which we see qualitative and mixed method social network analysis as being tools that we can use to help us address some of those pitfalls. And later on, I'm going to say a little bit more about metaphors. And Janine is then going to continue and talk more about the, the ethnic lens and the, the nation state lens and the migrant lens, uh, which has been a feature of her work. So then we have Bashak, um, who has a paper in the special issue entitled Personal Network Analysis from an Intersectional Perspective, How to Overcome Ethnicity Bias in Migration Research. And we're delighted that Bashak is here and she'll speak a bit more about her paper later on. The next paper then is by Alessio De Angelo, who unfortunately is not able to be here tonight. And his article is entitled The Network Refugee, The Role of Transnational Networks in the Journeys Across the Mediterranean. We then have a paper by um, Andreas Hertz and um, Alice Altissimo, um, Understanding the Structures of Transnational Youth, Immobility, a Qualitative Network Analysis. Then we have Mart Kindler's paper, which is on networking in context using qualitative network analysis insights into migration processes. And Marta is here this evening, and so she'll talk about her paper in a minute. 
Then we have Miranda's paper, which is co-authored with um, Jose Luis Molino and Christopher McCarthy. And that is how do network, how do migrants processes of social embedding unfold over time? And um, Miranda will tell us a bit more about that paper in a few minutes time. Then we have um, Valentina Mazzucatu's paper, Mixed Method Social Network Analysis for Multi-Sited Transnational Migration Research. Then there's my paper, Telling Network Stories, Researching Migrants Changing Social Relationships in Place Over Time. I'm not actually going to speak about my paper uh, this evening. So instead, maybe I'll just say a word about it now. So what I do in that paper is I really try to present this framework, which has kind of been emerging over many years in my research, this notion of, of looking at networks um, through the lens of telling stories. So to use a very qualitative narrative approach to understand how people talk about their networks, the ways in which they present their networks within research contexts. And, and using that tool of telling network stories to overcome the, the way in which networks is often used as a metaphor. So really to understand meaning, relationality and dynamism in, in people's interpretations and presentations of their network. So, so that's what I do in my article. We then have an article entitled Transnational Mobility Networks and Academic Social Capital Among Early Career Academics Beyond Common Sense Assumptions. And that's by Martin, who's here tonight, uh, Cedric Jaco and Janine de Hinden. So Martin is going to speak about that article in a little bit later on. And then the final article in the special issue is by Elena Sommer and Marcus Gamper. Marcus is here. Um, as you all know by now, Elena is on a train, but Marcus Gamper is here and he will speak about the paper, which is entitled Beyond Structural Determinism, Advantages and Challenges of Qualitative Social Network Analysis for Studying Social Capital of Migrants. So that was just a very, very quick summary of what the special issue entails. And as you can see, a very strong emphasis on social network analysis and the ways in which we can use social network analysis uh, and mixed methods analysis to really challenge some of the, the kind of more quantitative approaches which have dominated social network analysis, particularly over recent decades. So we're very excited about the special issue, which we see in all modesty, uh, we see this as being pathbreaking. We see this as a special issue, which really tries to push forward uh, qualitative social network analysis and mixed method analysis in migration research. And we're really hoping that this is a special issue that will be taken up and uh, will be used by many scholars across migration research, but perhaps beyond migration research as well, to, to really push forward the whole um, area of qualitative social network analysis. So with that big sell of the special issue, I'll now hand over to Janine, who's going to talk about the other um, big focus of the special issue, Janine. Many thanks, Louise. Well, you didn't really talk about the metaphorical use and, and the problems we, we have with this within uh, migration studies, but I think uh, what is clear is that basically we have two arguments in, in this special issue. So one is that social network analysis has the potential to address, allows to overcome, overcome the metaphoric use of network, which is quite widespread within migration studies. And I think this will be shown by, by the authors when they will uh, afterwards uh, present their articles. And on the other hand, and this is what I maybe will talk a little bit more about this, is that we also argue that social network analysis actually has the potential to overcome nation state and ethnicity centers epistemologies, which also are still quite common in migration studies. So I will not really go into this debate because I assume you're quite familiar with it, but maybe just in a nutshell, I mean, I, you all know that it's now roughly 30 years, I think, that scholars have been struggling with particular challenges concerning these epistemological and theoretical underpinnings of migration studies. And particularly, critical voices, they shed light on the ways in which knowledge production in this field is entangled with hegemonic structures. So primarily migration research, and this is uh, also what the, what the authors represent in this special issue, has been quite heavily criticized for 
contributing to reproducing not only the national order of things, as Lisa Malki stated already in 92, but also of reproducing methodological nationalism. And here, of course, I'm talking about the seminal paper by Andreas Swimmer and Nina Glick-Schiller, but also the ethnic lands or kind of migrantization of, the popula of populations. And some researchers like Bridget Anderson, but also myself, we have argued that the category of the migrant is actually not only normatively and politically colored, but also deeply anchored in and the result of a nation state logic, and that a migrant is actually generally perceived as a racialized, poor and subordinated person whose movements are actually problematic. So in this sense, this critique we also want to address in this issue is actually that uh, the study of migration continues to run the risk of reinforcing this deeply entrenched belief that there are such things like stable, sedentary and superior national communities whose existence is threatened by migrants. So the critique is basically that uh, in migration studies, we often reproduce this nation state logic and hence also hegemonic power structures. And the question is, of course, OK, why do we think that social network analysis has the potential to address at least partly this critique of ethno and national center epistemologies? There are, of course, other critiques which are currently very much debated within migration studies. And I think the most important is uh, the kind of uh, amnesia or aphasia when it comes to colonial legacies of current migration regimes, which have not been really theorized within migration studies. But this might be another special issue. We really wanted to address in this issue the question of, of, of migrantization, of ethnization of, of migrants through our studies. And we think that social network analysis has the potential to address at least partly these critiques. And why? First, I think it's related to what the, I would call the worldview of social network researchers. So network researchers are much less interested in individuals and their categorical attributions, but they are more interested in embeddedness of individuals in a kind of web of specific relationships. So network researchers want to understand the pattern of this embeddedness, the quality and significance of relationships, and also the consequences. In other terms, the worldview of network researchers implies a kind of shift from categories to embeddedness. So not categories and individuals are in the interest, but the interest is really in the dynamics of processes of embedding, as Louise herself calls these, these processes. And this means that the focus of network researchers is basically placed on the structure, on the quality and the meaning of social relations, and they do not start their research from primarily and mostly ethnically or nationally or racially, ra racially defined groups, as it is so often the case in migration studies. And they also avoid to be interested only in same ethnic or kinship relations. So they go beyond the migrantization or ethnization from the beginning of their studies. And it is this particular lens, and I think we will hear this in the presentation, which we will hear in a minute, that really this view encourages the exploration of multi-level and cross-cutting ties. Of course, always according to a particular research question, it is at stake. And to put it a bit differently, so this worldview is actually first interested in understanding the pattern of social networks. And this opens up in a second stop the space for analyzing the role of migration and ethnicity or racialization within these networks and how they interact with other structuring forces like migration regimes, social class, inequalities, discrimination or gender. And this potential has been quite identified, I think, by many network scholars. Meanwhile, that's also why we, we see actually currently quite a lot of scholars starting to use this also qualitative network approaches. And they really try to investigate kind of migration issues from this kind of demigrantized and de-ethnicized perspective. And I think, and or I think we think, and we will hear this, this brings in many nuances to migration debates, and we have quite a lot of interesting results. And you will hear, of course, some of them in 
a couple of minutes. So I'm, I'm really, really excited to be here and I'm so happy that so many authors joined us. And we will continue with these presentations, but first I give back to Louise who will, I think, introduce shortly Jonathan. Thank you very much, Janine. So very briefly, I would like to now introduce um, one of the editors of the journal Global Networks. We are delighted that we had so much support from Global Networks. We, it was the journal that Janine and I, when we first had the idea of doing a special issue, Global Networks was our number one choice. And we were just so excited that they agreed and they thought that our special issue was, was definitely worthy of appearing in their esteemed journal. So we're delighted that Professor Jonathan Beaverstock from the University of Bristol is here this evening and he's going to say a bit um, more from the journal's perspective. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very um, much. Yeah, great. We can hear and see you. Thanks, Thank Jonathan. Thank you very much, Louise. It's an absolute pleasure and honour to be here this evening to uh, listen uh, to the launch of the, the special issue. Um, and I think uh, due credit uh, has got to be given to uh, my predecessor, uh, Ali Rogers, who I believe started off this special issue, and I was delighted to tail the special issue uh, to publication. So as you know, uh, Global Networks is a journal of transnational affairs. Um, it's actually been going for 20 years. Um, it started off as a Blackwell publication, and now it's a Wiley journal. And I think over the last 20 years, it's stuck to its mission. Um, it's an interdisciplinary journal. It's focused on a transnational perspective uh, rather than a national or, or international approach. So transnational uh, is uh, running through its mission. Um, it emphasizes border crossing, networks, flows, connections. And I guess what it does is it celebrates um, human agency and globalization from below, uh, as it were. Um, and it focuses on trying to advance both um, conceptual um, processes in different fields, but also uh, empirical as well. So it very much celebrates uh, the um, the mixed methods approach um, and the the contribution that uh, the qualitative uh, can make in migration studies, uh, mobility studies across um, subjects, uh, disciplines like human geography, social anthropology, migration studies, and so on and so forth. And I think this special issue um, had quality social network uh, analysis can offer new opportunities in transnational uh, migration research. It epitomizes the mission of global networks. Um, and it's, a, and it's, it's an exemplar for you know, the special issues that we want to see in global networks, because what it's doing is it's questioning the conventional. It's adding a contribution it's making agendas and setting off agendas, you know, which is really important for others to follow. And I think the the collection uh, of essays, I think, you know, it brings two things. I think first what we have is a, a collection of insightful uh, individual essays that each in their own uh, opportunity offers a significant contribution, you know, in their um, in their theoretical and their empirical field. But I think more importantly, what the special issue does is it actually brings the sum of the parts, the synergies. It's what a special issue should all be about. It's topped by the really incisive um, introduction to the special issue and the, the themes that run through the papers just galvanizes uh, those particular uh, missions. So, it's about the sum of the parts. And actually, it's a benchmark for future special issues and wannabes who want special issues. So it's a tall order to follow uh, this particular collection of essays, but uh, I'm sure future authors can do that. So I think from my perspective, it's, it's high compliments to, to the editors uh, who brought forward the, um, the proposal to, to Ali Rogers. Um, and also, um, you know, it's, it's, it's high compliments as well to the, 
the individual authors who, through their work, just embellishes and epitomizes what a special issue should all be about. But more importantly, it's a great stamp for, you know, global networks uh, position in the crowded field of journals in globalization and transnationalism. So many congratulations to the authors, many congratulations and thanks to uh, Louise and Janine for uh, producing this um, collection in a special issue form. And uh, many congratulations from me um, because you made my task exceptionally straightforward when it came to acceptance and it came to um, making this special issue uh, shift from um, in train to accept early view and then to publication. So thank you very much indeed. And I wish you all the very best for uh, the, uh, the, the conference uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Thank you for all your kind words. And indeed, yes, Ali Rogers, who, who was very helpful to us at the beginning. So I'll now hand back to Janine, who's going to introduce our first three author presenters. Janine. Thank you, Louise. And thanks a lot, Jonathan, for these really kind words. So as Louise said at the beginning, we have actually five authors here, and they will shortly present the article. We will split this up. We will have first three of them, then we will have a moment for Q&A, and then we will have this, the, another two presentations, another round of Q&A, and then we really will open up the floor to more general questions as well when it comes to social network analysis and migration studies. So what we ask to do, the authors, is to very shortly, so they have six minutes, <laughs> to, to, to really show us how did they, in their contribution, apply a qualitative network approach in order either to address this kind of metaphoric use or to overcome this metaphoric use of networks, or how do they address this nation state and ethnicity centered epistemologies? So we have first, the first three are Miranda, Marcus, and Marta. And let me shortly introduce Miranda for those who do not know her. I think she's a bit of work on social networks. At least if you're just uh, marginally interested in social network, you, 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 you come across her work, which I like a lot, by the way. So Miranda Lubers is associate professor at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology of the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. And I directly hand over to you, Miranda, please. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Louise and Janine. It's been a great pleasure to participate, participate in this special issue, which started with a really nice seminar also in uh, Neuchâtel. And um, as Janine said, networks have often been used as an explanation of migration and post-migratory uh, adaptation, but often metaphorically. And there are these many normative models of how people would become assimilated or integrated over time. But for a long time, networks have not been, were not actually mapped, or maybe some, some um, summary measure was taken, right? How many people do you know? How many locals do you know? But not really looking at, at how did you come to know these people, for example. So uh, this hinders our understanding of, of how people are embedded in networks in reality. Uh, locally and transnationally, and how that changes over time, and what drives these changes. So in the article we reported about or research where we interviewed migrants in Spain from different ethnic groups uh, two to three times over a period of eight years post-migration, and each time we asked them to um, um, talk about 45 relationships that they felt close with or that they were that were important to them in some way or another. And then we compared those networks uh, to understand what uh, what dynamics drove them, right? How how did they have these processes of local and transnational embedding? And then we talked also with them more openly in a qualitative way to understand what had caused the changes, what they meant for them. Um, and so in contrast to societal discourse that sees integration as a very agentic process, what we found is that much of uh, becoming locally embedded is actually out of the control of migrants. So first, it depends very much on where people land in society. 
you live in a neighborhood that is predominantly British, if we translate this to Great Britain, uh, and if you work directly with, with British colleagues, for example, if your friends have friends who are also Brits, then it's much easier for you to connect with Brits than when you live in a poorer, segregated neighborhood, mainly populated by other migrants, work in the secondary labor market also, mostly with other migrants, and have friends in similar positions, similar positions. So um, you may, may do the same things to connect to people, meet with colleagues after work, for example, connect to friends, but this leads to entirely different networks. Uh, so to, to really become integrated, if we use that term that we don't like actually, <laughs> you must have uh, frequent meeting opportunities with locals and in, also in conditions of equality uh, in order to connect with them. So apart from this initial emplacement, what we found is that these meeting opportunities also heavily depended on life events. For example, if you had a kid who went to, to a school or if you've just been fired from work and those life events then open or close uh, new settings to you or old settings. And third, we saw that there was a lot of uh, uh, fluctuation over time. So for example, people reconnect with others in their countries of origin during the summer holidays or Muslims feel more connected to other Muslims during Ramadan. So this is something that, well, you will find at one particular interview, but if you come back a month later, for example, it may already have changed again. So there was a lot of fluctuation also that was actually temporal. And thus embedding did not follow these, these normative models of assimilation or integration that is either linear or with a glass ceiling or whatever, but it's actually more like a continuously evolving thing and what is more important is that it's actually very similar to things that we all have. I mean, all our networks change with these events and all our networks have temporal fluctuations as well. So just to think about the COVID lockdowns, right? How it, it also had a big impact on the networks of everyone. So, um, so in some qualitative personal network analysis can give us this realistic detailed view on how networks change over time, how people really connect with, um, persons in reality, so to speak. And second, as Janine said, it overcomes nationality and ethnicity centered epistemologies because we can study migrants together with non-migrants and we can also ask about their relationships independently of where people live or what status they have. So thus, instead of, as, as Janine has written very nicely, uh, instead of imposing the category of migrant, we can actually study whether the category of migrant has uh, makes any sense is it if it is any meaningful category for processes of embedding and if so for what part of those uh, processes or whether there are other uh, categories that are much more uh, uh, able to explain the variation in these embedding processes and that's it i think i've talked six minutes by now <laughs> thanks a lot miranda for this short presentation and I, I think, uh, well, there are many things in this six minutes you said, but two things are really important. It, look, it seems to me that this kind of dynamic approach you brought into social networks, so looking at how our networks developing over time, because this often also, we, we have just this spot of networks when it comes to one particular time in our life, but this allowed you to really to show that life events, for instance, for migrants and non-migrants, impact on the network structure etc so mm -hmm. i think we we will come back to this in the discussion afterwards but uh, i think these are really highly relevant uh, results basically thanks a lot <laughs> and i give go over to markus gamper who is academic rat this does not exist in english i think what you are but i think it's a kind of associate professor he's at the institute for comparative educational research and social science at the University of Cologne. So please, Marcus, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, uh, chosen uh, for this wonderful special issue. Um, I want to say Elena is not here, so, but she is. Um, so um, she can listen to what I say. So she cannot talk about her article. I'm really sorry because she sits in the train and has a bad internet connection. But it is how it is. Um, um, our article was named Beyond Structural Determinism, Advantages and Challenges of Qualitative Social Network Analysis for Studying Social Capital of Migrants. And if you look at the title, it has three things in it, social capital, social network, 
and transmigration or migration movement. Uh, and we started with the um, theoretical uh, article made by um, Amy Bayer, where he talked about uh, social networks. And he talked about that at the beginning in the 1980s, like BERT, social network were used to, to explain agency, but there was only network and then agency. So this is uh, something that went to the 80s and went through the network and this is still now, like um, Chanin said, it's dominated by quantitative methods. And this is normally the part, you have social networks, a structure and relations, and then you look at health, migration movements, or something and then you take an urban or something else and say this has influence on movement on the word I hate like Miranda integration whatever it is whatever it means is a political um, wording and and we went from this structure determinism theoretical part uh, to social capital and if you look at Lynn or others uh, even Bourdieu, but he was not a friend of social network analysis, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Lin said that social capital is embedded in the social network. Um, clear, easy, it's true. But on the other hand, it's how can social capital be researched on and, and what does and how it helps for um, migrants who are self-employed. And in front of this background, we look at uh, former Soviet Union migrants who came to Germany. And we looked how they built up their company. But we don't look only at the relation inside Germany. We looked at relations over abroad and we looked at the transnational relations. So we looked who helped you in Germany, but who were the others who helped you to build up your company uh, and like transnational set, also states were involved in this kind of social capital buildings. You know, if a new law comes in the game, sometimes our interview said, no, oh, no, we cannot transport cars anymore to Russia because we have to go to Poland and then we have to go to White Russia and then they change the policemen all the time and they want money. So the business was gone because social network changed through states laws. And this is a combination we want, we, we did research on. On the other hand, like, uh, like Janine said, this is one side of the special issue that we looked at transnationalism and the changing of social capital and transnationalism. But on the other side, we looked on qualitative network analysis. And what we did, we, we combined interviews and social network paintings or maps, whatever the wording is. And we looked how can they come together and how do you use interviews with maps? Because it's not that easy that people paint their maps and it's done. You also have to go to the interviews and how to combine them. And uh, how does painting, what does it with the people who are doing interviews and how does it help and how can you use qualitative interviews to, to see changes in the networks and and all those big issues that qualitative network analysis are, have advantages to quantitative network analysis and at the end um, uh, we talk we found out so then we had we uh, we come to the end or i come to the end is that it's really helpful to use qualitative paintings with interviews to get the changes behind transnational relationships, even embedded not only in relations, but also in the macro level states and the micro level of persons. But on the other hand, this is the problem in our opinion is there is not much done about how to combine maps with interviews. What is done with biograph? biographic interviews, problem-centric interviews. How do you combine them with which kind of visual data collection? And, and on the collection, there's a lot done. You know, you have Miranda, where a lot of others than me, you have Venmaker, a lot of things done. But for the interpretation and data analyzed, 
there is not much done. Andreas Herz did a small article, but then there are a lot of things missing. And at the end, we say there has to be done more with analyze, not of data collection. I think there's a lot of done, even in migration research, it's really done, the special issue or the special issue of Miranda uh, within social networks that show it. But I think for the analyze of we do it while we do it. But at the end, there had to be a methodological handbook or something who explained how to do it well. So this is something we find out. And I think this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Marcus. I think uh, I think it got clear that the, you have this transnational perspective, which I think is very valuable. But your contribution really brings up also the discussion about methodologies within qualitative uh, network research. And I might say that we had so much support from, from Marcus when, it, when we did our research, trying to work with Menmaker, where he, I don't know, those who do network research, you're probably familiar with Menmaker, but uh, it's this program you kind of started together with colleagues. And, and I think uh, we see this also in the article because we have all these reflections about, okay, how to bring together visual, data these maps together with biographical interviews etc and i think this is a really important contribution to to this special issue particularly also how do are you doing this transnationally kind of so how do you bring this in so many really many thanks for for this and also many thanks to elena and the last presenter in this first round is marta kindler and she's at the Faculty of Applied Social Science and Resocialization at the University of Warsaw. And she's a research fellow at the Center of Migration Research in Warsaw. And I'm very happy that Martha is here. We had a lot of discussion about networks together. Also, last time I was in Warsaw. So please, the floor is yours, Martha. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well now? Because I had some technical issues. Perfect. 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 Wonderful. These are overcome then. Thank you very much uh, to a big thank you that I was um, that I had the opportunity to be part of this special issue. Uh, now, um, as Louise and Janine wrote actually in the introduction to this special issue, networks do not exist outside of us and they do not float in the air. So they are embedded and evolve in particular contexts, whether geographical or historical. And in my analysis, I actually focus on the dynamically changing context in the case of Ukrainian migrants networking in Poland. Now, these contexts are linked to work and study and migrant community, and they provide migrants with particular opportunities and constraints, not only to form social ties, but also to draw boundaries. Now, I wanted to look more in depth at how migrants draw boundaries to overcome this belief that migrants' ethnicity is the key to understand uh, who they form relationships with, which continues to be very popular still in research, yes, and also in studies using quantitative network analysis. It is often assumed, for example, that bridging ties are basically cross-ethnic ties and that these are essential for accessing social capital needed for so-called integrations. So, so this qualitative network analysis allows actually, in my opinion, to really deconstruct this ethnicity box and see what is behind it. Um, from the research project we had, um, which had also quantitative part, but I used the qualitative data for this paper, uh, I uh, analyzed uh, network visualization and in-depth interviews. And the key here was that these migrants who um, in, the data which I analyzed, some of them arrived before the year 2014 and some after 2014. And this is a crucial moment because this is the moment where the Russian-Ukrainian military conflict started uh, and um, the scale of migration to Poland increased dynamically. And what was really striking was the fact that um, the, um, the migrants who arrived before 2014 clearly had more diverse networks and had some falls in these networks and those who arrived after um, were the rather only Ukrainian, um, they had ties basically only to other Ukrainians. And um, I was not satisfied with thinking uh, about this, okay, that 
those who arrived before 2014 were basically longer in Poland, and that's why had they have more diverse networks. There seemed to be more behind this. And um, when this divide uh, uh, into along ethnicity, along this Polish-Ukrainian divide as well here, was very much linked to changing demographic institutional context for interactions, uh, uh, as came out from the from the analysis. And, uh, for example, one of my interviewees reflected on how she, uh, having arrived in the early 2000s, she networked with a number of people at university, at work. She met also Poles, who remained, some of them remains her friends until today. In contrast, her sister, who arrived after 2015, she met only and found ties with other Ukrainians. Um, so the qualitative data shows here this change that occurred at several levels. So basically, the number of migrants from Ukraine available for interaction substantially is greater, but also the institutional settings changed because of that. So, for example, in terms of the study environment, um, uh, there are right now special dormitories for foreign students, which was not the case before, yes, which is a space for interaction as well. This very much resonates with also what Miranda spoke about. Also, there are special labor market niches for workers with Ukrainian and Russian language competences. For example, one of my interviewees also he mentioned that he co uh, works in so a so-called Ukrainian department. He's surrounded by 40 other colleagues who are Ukrainian nationals, and of course, he becomes as well friends with them. Um, another issue that was mentioned by the interviewees was the change uh, in terms of attitudes of Poles uh, towards them, that the, the, uh, the attitudes were before more uh, open, more friendly. Right now, there's more closer, closer distrust. And one uh, of the reactions to this was on the side of the Ukrainian migrants as well to basically draw boundaries as a as a counter reaction to this. Now, the qualitative network approach also allowed me to take a closer look at whether boundaries were drawn apart from this here, this Ukrainian Polish divide. And um, and show a more complex picture. Um, basically, uh, those migrants who arrived earlier so um, uh, draw boundaries towards those newcom the newcomers or uh, the, those who arrived later on. And, and um, this was very similar what we see as well in other research, for example, when it comes to polls in the UK. Um, how people react to newcomers because they want to take care of their own reputation, yes, especially in relation to the dominant society, so basically to an external audience. So lines were drawn along class, along education, along language as well, so Ukrainian language versus Russian language, but also uh, in terms of a certain unwillingness, or as it's been said, unwillingness of the new, new uh, arriving Ukrainians to learn Polish. Um, and but what was more important as well was when we look later on at how people network at their practices. This went beyond what they said about. So uh, so although they were distancing themselves in, their, in terms of the rhetoric and and draw boundaries, symbolic boundaries. When it came to practice, very often they did. They were important contact points. They were important ties to people who needed resources from this new. Um, uh, newly arrived Ukrainian migrants, also many of them who are not actually in their networks. So, so these were ad hoc ties, who, who people who asked for help and received help. So, summing up, this qualitative network approach allows for more precision, in my opinion. I mean, who stands behind the numbers? What role do these ties play? Uh, how and when can they be mobilized? By whom? and also how the opportunities and constraints to engage in relations change with this changing context. Thanks a lot, Marta. I think, uh, well, again, this is an extremely important contribution to this special issue. I liked it how you put it, you phrased it, like of I use qualitative social network analysis in, analysis in order to open up the ethnicity box <laughs> and I think the interesting thing is that you really show how we need this qualitative network uh, analysis in order also to be able to grasp the impact of, of context of political 
context, but also of discursive uh, changements and how this impacts actually on social networks. So while Miranda talked about life events, you talk more about this context. And I think this is a, these are two, two really complementary and very nice perspectives. So many thanks also for your contribution. So what we will do now is that we will have a 10, 15 minutes Q&I section. And I would like the participants maybe to, to write in the chat the comments or questions. And maybe I could also ask you to write whom are you asking the question. So if you want to write in the, the names or Marta or Marcus or Miranda, please go ahead. And we hope there will be some comments and some questions. And maybe Louise again would like to to kind of uh, <laughs> feel these two minutes until people start to, to write down the question and, and ask maybe one question or make a comment or whatever you would like to. Thank you, Janine. Well, I mean, I would also say that if people wanted to ask us a question or they wanted to ask a general question, um, as there aren't any questions in the chat right now, perhaps some people feel a bit, if English isn't their first language, they may feel a bit put off by typing the question. So if somebody has a question, they can also put their hand up and just ask the question if they would feel more comfortable doing that. I mean, if we don't have a lot of questions right now, maybe people need time to process and think. So we could also, um, move on a bit quicker than we had anticipated if there aren't any particular questions or maybe one of the presenters would like to ask somebody else a question that's also possible of course oh we've got a question yes do you see a border yes. yeah do you see a border barrier between early migrant groups and those that come later so is that directed particularly to marta because i think marta was raising that issue yes yes <laughs> marta please thank you very much yes well that's what i mentioned that in terms of rhetorics there was a lot of distancing a lot of boundary drawing uh, but at the same time Thanks to this network approach, because we looked at how actually ties are formed when they're when when they're activated, when the resources available in social networks are used, um, there was much more to it. Yes, so so uh, although the rhetorics were mm, there was a lot of um, also um, this division mm, between people who had higher education and actually had a, a high skilled job. Um, who um, somehow drew a boundary saying we are not like the Zarobichanya, yeah? so people who come here uh, basically for seasonal work. But at the same time, it was clear that they were, they had situations in which they were very open to um, provide help just because someone was from Ukraine and because someone was in need. So, so this, uh, I think that's why this network approach is so valuable here. Thank you, Marta. Mm -hmm. There's another question. Well, while we see wrote also, we see that amongst immigrants here in the US. So mm -hmm. I think that's interesting to make these comparisons. And then there is Bernie. How stable, well understood were the notions of edges in the research? This is a question for Marta, but also for Marcus to elaborate. Did migrants and local differ in the notions of what constituted a link? Did the researchers have to update what constituted a sufficiently important link as time progress? What about cross-cultural links? So I don't know who would like to start, Marcus or Marta? Who would like to start? I can start because I can just answer the last question about what about cross-cultural links. And uh, thanks, Bernie, for your question. First up is that, that we looked at Russian Germans or people from Russia coming to Germany and uh, had, are self-employed and we looked how network helped them to, to build up their companies and then we have different kinds of relations. We have the relations of abroad and there it could be Russians or not Russians and then you have the relations in Germany and this can be cross-cultural or not cross-cultural but it depends on the strategy of the interviewee for us, because it's employee. 
employ uh, self-employed people. So if we have a transnational idea of bringing cars to Russia, they need both. You know, cross-cultural uh, in Germany, we need German friends for law and understanding the process, uh, but they are not so much, but they have a lot of strong family ties who gave money and emotional support. And in Russia, these are friendship ties, but they transform it later to arm length ties because depending on friendship, it's not that well for business in some cases. So we transform relations from friendship to arm length type. Arm length types is a, is a wording by Utsi and means contract. You know, we make a contract and you get money if you it. It's not depending of trust or something. And this is changing, so um, yes. Thank you, Markus. Marta, would you like to add something? Um, yes, I only can add that um, in the study I carried out, we did not really um, study uh, um, locals. We only focused on migrants. Um, and um, it was clear as well that although some of the ties, um, uh, like some of the ties were from when we did the, um, the migration experience interview, so, so to say, how, to see how as well how they use their network. That some of the ties were dormant and some were activated at particular points. So um, it was difficult to say what it means actually sufficiently important uh, in terms of time progress. I guess it depends really on the life event at that moment when 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 the tie can be activated. Thank you, Marta. Maybe we take a last question before we continue with the other two presentations. So that's Orasolia. Could Marcus comment a bit more on the methodological issue of bringing together data from interviews and network maps? Sure, this is good. Just an hour, Marcus, please. Yeah, yeah, I know. I have an article here. It's coming out last year. But you like, like Janine said, it's so difficult because we work with problem centric interviews because we have a special issue, a special problem, namely self employed people. And then we use network maps. So we structure it already. But like you can be open, but I think open network maps where nothing is on the map, it's empty. It's good for bio biography interviews or where the issue is not so clear. Uh, then it's better to make it open and leave it open. But uh, the problem is we looked at the maps and when we looked at the relations and when we went to the interviews and looked what did they say about this relation. But you can also go to turn away around to take the interviews and then you go to the map. But like I said before, there's nothing, this article is how you collect data, but there's not much done about how to analyze it and how to compare with the analyzed. So this is why I cannot say it's so much, but um, this is how we did it in short way. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, I mean, Louise also works with this map and biographical interviews, etc. cetera. Um, maybe we have the other two presentations now, and then we might go back to some questions. So during the presentation, also feel free to put in, to put in questions. And I hand out over to Luis, who will introduce the other two speakers. Please, Luis. Thanks, Janine, and thank you to the first three speakers. And I would love to jump into this conversation that Marcus has started about how we analyze interviews and network maps or network drawings. Uh, because, yes, it's very interesting and it's something I do. And it's something I do talk about in my article um, as well. So I think there is more work to be done there. But certainly, I think some of us have already started to try to think about how to bring together words and pictures, um, which is the topic of, of a book that I'm currently writing on. So this topic is very close to my heart. But without further ado, I would now like to move on to our next two short presentations. So the first of whom is um, Martine Scher, and she has co-authored her article with um, Cedric Jaco and Janine de Hinden. And that article is entitled Transnational Mobility Networks and Academic Social Capital Among Early Career Academics. So I think that's a topic that will interest many of us, Martine, on a personal level as well. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. I'm also very grateful that I had the opportunity to be part of this uh, special issue. And I'm happy to be here today to present this paper. 
So that, as you said, was co-written with uh, Janine and, and Cédric Jaco. And so this paper focuses on academic transnational mobility and more precisely on the mobility of early career academics from different countries, different disciplines, uh, and who have experienced transnational mobility in the sense that they moved abroad to take up a position, an academic position, or to conduct research activities in the context of fellowship, but in a country different than the one where, where they obtained their PhD. And so in our study, we investigate really the mobility networks of these academics, and we discuss in particular the composition of these networks in terms of transnationality, of academic social capital, and by doing so, we provide uh, empirical results which challenge common sense assumptions about mobility in academia. And so I would say that our use of social network research tools in this study really allowed us to move beyond metaphorical ideas in the sense, in our case, of moving beyond widespread assumptions which tend to conflate academic mobility with the creation and possession of academic transnational networks and thus tend to consider mobility as an indicator of academic excellence. So as, as you may know, transnational mobility among early career academics has increased significantly in the broadly the past 30 years. And so mobility has become increasingly presented as an indispensable aspect of, uh, of an academic career. And so there is this kind of celebration of mobility in academia, um, which is the result of widespread emphasis on the en enriching nature of transnational mobility, and at the same time, the discrediting of local careers. And so mobility has come to represent really important professional and symbolic capital that is today required informally or formally to pursue in academia. And so this celebration, this imperative of mobility is reflected in the funding schemes uh, in many academic systems that ask uh, that, that see mobility as a criteria for application for instance but it is also mobility is also a prerequisite to access certain academic position in many universities and, and different countries so some authors have argued that mobility is becoming a new metric of individual merit or they say that mobility is being fetishized to refer to the fact that mobility is valued as an end in itself, regardless of the quality of the mobility experience abroad. Uh, one important premise behind this mobility imperative in academia is the idea that mobility contributes to academic excellence because, because it allows scholars to build transnational networks. networks. So that's the link now with, uh, with uh, our paper. And the, the existence of this link between mobility and the development of academic transnational relationships is often taken for granted, remain unquestioned, and so there is a lack of empirical research on this topic. Although there is, of course, now a few studies that have uh, examined distinct, accept of, uh, dis distinct aspects of that, uh, that question. So in this paper, we were really interested in examining the networks, uh, the mobility networks of the interviewed academics to understand um, how their academic social capital is connected to their transnational mobility and how their mobility influences the transnationality of their networks. And to answer this question, we use the mixed method design, uh, combining biographical narrative interviews with qualitative ego-centered network interviews during which we grasp the all the people that help or were relevant during the decision making mobility decision making process and during the ex the experience of mobility of the early career academics and we conducted this interview with academics that we met at different universities in Switzerland in the UK and in the US and so we combine different kinds of analysis uh, of our data and in particular we, we we build also a quantitative database to make some calculation to see uh, these links between mobility academic social capital and tr network transnationality but we also analyzed uh, the narratives of the interviews to also see about the dynamics uh, and how the, the relationships were created and so on 
And so as we compare the composition of the network of a group that we define as highly mobile academics with another group of low mobile academics who had been mobile only once after the PhD, we could observe actually that the two groups had very similar proportion of academic social capital. Uh, and that while highly mobile academics had uh, more transnational networks, actually this higher proportion of transnational ties were not made of academic ties, but of family and uh, friendship ties. And so uh, the degree of mobility of the academics in our sa sample is not related to the uh, importance of academic social capital and highly mobile academics do not have more transnational academic ties than low mobile academics. Furthermore, the analysis of the narratives showed that early academics were in many occasions actually able to develop important transnational academic ties uh, in contexts in which they were not themselves engaging in mobility, such as, for instance, when foreign professor would come to give a talk or, or be on visit on a sabbatical at the university where the early career academics were studying or working. And so that the mobility of the professors actually were creating the opportunity for early career to meet with them and develop uh, useful relationship on which they could capitalize at a later stage. So these findings really show the heuristic value of network research instruments and our mixed method approach will be possible to highlight the complexity of these social uh, networks and social relationship and move beyond this common sense assumption about academic mobility. But also this finding also allowed to question how transnationality is addressed um, in a professional field in which actually the people with whom an early career academic is connected are also moving across border. And so this maybe links to uh, the critique of sedentary sedentarity that man, Janine mentioned in her introduction that is sometimes a characteristic of some uh, mainstream migration studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martine. And what I really liked about the article is it really speaks to the aims of the special issue in terms of going beyond the metaphor. And we hear so much about academic networks and networks being described in a very simplistic, metaphoric way. But what your paper really illustrates very clearly is how when you research those networks, when you critically interrogate those social connections, you really get a much better understanding of what is going on, who are the relationships with, and more importantly, what is the actual social capital that exists with between those ties, rather than these, as you say, common sense assumptions, that if you have all these academic networks, somehow it gives you access to valuable social capital. And so I think your article does a really nice job of, of interrogating that with, with a particular focus on academic networks. So thank you very much. There's already a question in the chat for you, which you might like to have a look at, but we'll hold off on that um, and we'll come back for the Q&A in a moment. But I now want to introduce our final author speaker today, last but by no means least, um, Bashak, who's going to talk to us briefly about her paper, which is entitled Personal Network Analysis from an Intersectional Perspective, how to overcome ethnicity bias in migration research. And can I just also remind people that as each paper is being introduced, my colleague Anna is immediately typing the link to that paper in the chat. So each of the papers presented here today, you now have the link, including Bashak's, which has just appeared in the chat. Bashak, over to you. Thank you very much, Louise. I'm, I'm really very happy uh, to be here and to see many people also join us today online. And I'm, of course, very grateful and happy to be the part of this special issue. I will not try, I will try not to exceed my six minutes. <laughs> I, I see that it's getting late and we also want to have a discussion. So I cannot, of course, summarize the whole paper in six minutes. What I will try to do is just to raise a couple of uh, points, but I'm also inspired maybe to address some of the questions that are coming in the chat uh, on how we also combine the network maps and, and interviews, for example, that I also do, I can address to that. So, well, I can start uh, with this observation that all of us uh, here, I think, can agree that ethnicity is a very important category in migration studies. 
and uh, and it's also very much uh, used by politicians and highly politicized in order to draw the boundaries. Who is a migrant? Who should be considered as a migrant? And who is not? And it's very prominent category also in network studies, investigating migrants' networks, their experiences, for example, in the labor market. When we read uh, previous studies, we see a lot about uh, also, as, um, as Marta mentioned, the bonding and bridging ties as if it, it should be ethnicity that is then the common denominator for um, uh, for this type of um, ties that could be helpful um, in, in supporting to the labor market uh, incorporation integration. So here, while writing this this, this paper, I of course uh, completely agree that the ethnicity as a category should not go unquestioned, and its also meaning in our study designs and analysis should not go unquestioned. And I, I was also inspired by, of course, uh, by many other studies. Uh, but here, maybe two main ideas came uh, um, very much to the forefront while writing this. Uh, is the first one, right? The, the bridging and bonding ties and their role in the labor market. And this emphasis on ethnicity, particularly when it comes to the personal network studies in general. And the second uh, one was about um, the international students uh, coming from international students literature that is about their experiences of support and lack of friendship, uh, what is called with non mobile or host students. And it is usually done so far in the literature by using metaphors. Uh, so th uh, I think that's why uh, here I address to both. Uh, both of your arguments also starting today. This is where I'm also coming from and we're all on this very same page. I'm quite happy. So uh, in my contribution, I argue we can and, and actually, uh, well, here I can say we should challenge the category of ethnicity in studying migration related phenomena and how to do it here. I just try to give a roadmap. Uh, how can we overcome this main emphasis on ethnicity by using what I call in this in this article personal network analysis from an intersectional perspective? So here I argue that the intersectional lens can be used in migration studies when analyzing uh, personal networks qualitatively as an approach to understand the meanings of relationships that inform the processes of inclusion, exclusion, boundary making, and therefore social inequalities. So by analyzing the personal networks of Chinese, international Chinese students in the US, I demonstrate in this article which categories become important in relation to others. And more specifically, I look at when ethnicity becomes important in intersection with other categories but when ethnicity becomes also not so relevant. So how I did it maybe very briefly is then giving my uh, participants a, consent, a paper and pencil version of a concentric circle where the ego is in the middle. And I pose them a very open question you can find um, in, in the article under uh, where I describe the study. Uh, the name generator question I, I started with was very open, whom did they know, uh, actually inspired by Miranda's earlier work. Um, and when they named the persons in the concentric circles, according to their importance, I asked uh, if they can also, um, uh, for me, if they can also tell what the meaning of importance for them is. And later I asked uh, different questions. And I think by doing so, uh, for example, they uh, could nominate so many different persons. Uh, and also, for example, they named those who were their transnational ties, or who were the, the, the local ties. So I let them write about it, uh, the names freely and later ask the questions, the name interpreters. And right after conducting this network map part, I, um, I continued with the interview while the network map was still on the table and the participants could really reflect on those people whom they told me earlier about. And they went on uh, at length uh, in the interview more deeper in the meanings of the ties and the support, for example, uh, that they received or given 
or maybe some conflicts that arise um, at, at some point of time. So in a way, what I've done then transcribed all the material and then analyzed uh, with, uh, through using thematic analysis with the intersectionality always in mind. So this is how I conducted, for example, this study. And here, uh, well, I'll just raise uh, very shortly what uh, I, in my findings, that you can reach ethnicity uh, turned out to be important to make friends. It is usually for the participants used as a shortcut to indicate their shared culture through language, food, rituals, uh, customs, uh, such as also celebrating spring festival with the family and cultural products such as literature, jokes, Instagram or YouTube videos that they share. And such shared values, common cultural and social practices were cited as making them feel closer to their Chinese friends and family members. And they, they became aware of this fact when they were studying in another country. And here I argue that ethnicity can function both in including and excluding category based on commonalities in the friendship networks. And here I give an example of how one of the participants was made uh, to feel excluded from her peer groups, mainly based on her ethnicity, but also in interaction with class and gender. So, and this is how it, how ethnicity functions uh, or, or turned out to be important. And as the final word, uh, when ethnicity did not become a very important category was when, uh, uh, when they talked about their future plans and when, when, and their concerns with who could help them uh, in, in the labor market to be called for a job interview or to land a job and realize that being connected to certain others who could act as a bridge for the wanted job is, was the regardless of their ethnic background of, or was, impo was important. So there more the social position, the status was cited as to be the main uh, main important category uh, rather than ethnicity. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Bashak. And as you say, one of the key strengths of your article was bringing that intersectional lens to the fore and really challenging the very ethnic dominated lens in migration studies to really show how class, gender, age, etc., all of those other factors really come together. And as you say, they can come in and out of focus at different moments in time and in different situations. And, and that really helps to add to the overall aim of the special issue as well, in terms of challenging the use of that very strong ethnic lens in, in migration research. So thank you very much for your contribution. So we've now got about 15 minutes left. Um, so I will open the floor for more questions. Now, I know that there's already a question in the chat for um, Martine. So maybe we'll give Bashak a, a chance to draw her breath. And Martine, there's a question for you. So if you've got any questions, please type now or put up your hand um, and we'll come back to Bashak. Martine, the, would you like to answer that question? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. So um, with regard to uh, male and female academics, early career academics in the sample, the, the the paper in this special issue is based on, on the interview with 40 academics, 20 of them were women and 20 were, were men. And for the rest, we really try to have a maximal variation sampling uh, to have different disciplines, people from different nationalities, so and reflecting different trajectory and family situation. But in terms of uh, male, uh, um, men and women, we have 20 of each in the in, in in the analysis then with regard to the question about native couples if they contribute to the improvement of the migrant subject uh, i this doesn't emerge from my data i must also also say that i never really approach my data with this kind of research question uh, in mind so maybe a way to answer is rather but here I'm thinking more of another analysis that I did uh, from, from this data and not in this particular paper about all the negative impacts and the difficulties and obstacles um, that academics have to deal uh, with during their mobility experiences. And it, it seems to me rather than 
the support of that they receive that may help their daily conditions is more support uh, i mean doesn't have to to isn't related to the fact of being in contact with native people or not native people but rather with the resources that people can help can provide them and, and can be just for a very concrete example the help they can bring to help with the um, um, responsibility for the children for instance so it could be uh, facilities services but it could be also uh, a, a grandfather or a grandmother who comes and help uh, with the children and maybe commute for that and so those are really concrete support that really help the mobility conditions of the of the interviewees thank you martine so bashak there's a question for you now in the chat um which is about negative ties which is again a, a really important topic so i don't know if you can see the question in the chat would you like to respond to that bashak yes thank you louise so the question here from uh, from dorothea for the record I, I maybe i'll just state the question before i answer for those who might want to watch later on uh, asking me yes about the negative or difficult ties i'm curious if you have found any kind of relationship between those and ethnicity or intersectionality thanks a lot dorothea i uh, well specifically well when, when thinking about those uh, difficult ties um i can say it also in the paper for example it was mainly the female participants who were uh, quite uh, concerned about their families uh, back in China who are getting older because they are one child, uh, they, are, they are a single child in their families. And those uh, daughters were really very much thinking about their study abroad decisions and questioning and uh, as well uh, saying uh, uh, and as their part of the future plan was to return to China because then the expectation from the family is that they must take care of, of their families, but they also are willing to do so. But some of them were really struggling, although saying, yes, I would like to stay longer in the US. And what happens, and, and thinking about the future, what happens if I also want to get married or settled in the US and who will uh, be able to take care of my parents? So these are uh, the, the gendered uh, norms of, of uh, caregiving uh, was very much um, uh, prominent in those transnational target families. Thank you very much, Bashak. Um, I can see that there's actually a question in the chat for me, which is which is nice to see, which is about longitudinal uh, research and many of the of the papers in the special issue actually do use longitudinal research. Miranda uh, talks about longitudinal research. And of course, Valentina Mazzucato has been a pioneer in multi-sided ethnographic longitudinal research. And, and her paper talks about that. But yes, in my paper, I do also use longitudinal research. And it's something that I've been doing for many years where I have followed my participants sometimes to go back and interview them eight or 10 years later. And I completely appreciate from the question that's been posed in the chat that it's not always possible to do longitudinal research. But one of the key advantages of longitudinal research is that it overcomes that challenge of memory. Because when you are interviewing people about networks in the past or how their networks have changed, you're very reliant on, on their memory of how they then recall and reconstruct and represent the, what networks they used to have in the past and what relationships were important in the past. Whereas the advantage of longitudinal research is that you're actually getting those relationships at that particular moment in time. And then if you go back and interview them five years later or three years later, as Miranda has also done, you can see how those relationships have changed, what relationships have strengthened, what relationships have faded away. And, and those negative ties as well that Bashak is talking about very much come through where you can see some of the relationship breakdown over time through that longitudinal research brings those kinds of negative ties to the fore because you ask, oh, last time I met you, you spoke about your friend. Uh, you haven't mentioned your friend this time and, and that can bring to the fore all kinds of um, fractured relationships, which which otherwise can be quite hard to to research. So I just wanted to to address that question about the advantages, but also the challenges of longitudinal research. It's also expensive if you've got to keep going back to the same participants or sustaining participants in a study over time. 
Um, I don't know, Miranda, if you want to say something about longitudinal research, as I think that question is also relevant to you. No, I think you uh, summarized that very well. <laughs> uh, I think indeed that there is not actually a good alternative to uh, longitudinal research, although some people like Francisca, who was here as well, has been uh, use, have been using also retrospective methods. And of course, that's, that's an option if, if longitudinal research is not possible, but it comes with certain uh, pitfalls indeed. I also wanted to say now that, Bern, if I may, of course, of course. Yes. As Bernie is here and uh, Dion is also here, and he asked about uh, paper and pencil methods and about network canvas. And actually, Bernie has both written a fantastic paper about paper and pencil methods and field mm -hmm. methods in 2007. And also, he's one of the developers of network canvas. So maybe he could say something about that as well. About what yes, absolutely. Asked. And in fact, I was really, really influenced in my early work by Bernie's 2007. I believe it's 2007, Bernie, that, pa that paper you wrote about doing sociograms with pencil and paper. Bernie, are you still there? Can you hear us? Uh, Miranda suggesting that you might like to mm -hmm. turn your mic on and answer that question. Oh, uh, I am here, but I did step out during the question awkwardly. <laughs> Uh, and, oh, okay. Uh, well, it's lovely back. to see you, Bernie. Um, so the question was about um, using either paper and pencil or canvas, and Miranda was suggesting that as you you've, as you have also used canvas, maybe you'd like to say briefly share a, an experience of using canvas. Well, the funny thing is, is that was what prompted my question uh, to the participants earlier uh, about the stability of a link because part of the, the challenges of using the digital type approaches is that you really have to fix a priori a lot of categories. And so you often have to fix things like, you know, um, in, your, in your protocol, you might say, we have these many name prompts and they mean this, or say, draw a line between two people under these conditions. That's written right there on the screen. Whereas in some work, you might want to have your, um, uh, your work evolve over time. Um, now I've uh, I'm quite an advocate for network canvas, uh, and I can say as a as a small teaser, uh, because things are still um, uh, developing. COVID has accelerated our um, urgency to make a version that's in the browser. So there will be a browser version of it coming, but I can't say any more about that because it's really dependent on the uh, the project team. Uh, a lot of people appreciate what would be considered the professionalism that comes from using it in uh, on a tablet or through a Zoom call as opposed to pen and paper. Uh, so it really depends. It's very context dependent. Some people, on the other hand, find that professionalism to be a bit of more stultifying and formal, um, whereas, uh, you, you know, pen and paper means it's very creative and fun. So it's very context dependent, very important to test with your uh, research participants. Uh, in my own work, which has been um, sort of with uh, uh, young gay men uh, and HIV status type matters, uh, it's been very effective uh, to use the technological approach, especially longitudinally, because once they're acquainted with how to click around and stuff, and where Network Canvas kind of goes stage by stage, uh, the next time in the lab, they barely need any instructions at all. They just can go and almost self-administer the entire thing. Once Network Canvas is available in the browser, I anticipate an explosion of methodological studies with online participants comparing um, things that like where we just vary the wording or something and go to Mechanical Turk and change. But in the interim, I still think that that's logistically quite challenging. Uh, now, if, if I'd like to make a plug for a paper that's not by me, uh, but is uh, but is on pencil uh, uh, approaches, and that's Patricia Stee's most recent paper in the Methodological Special Issue of Social Networks. Um, and uh, Patricia, and then there's like a ton of of co-authors, and she talks about her work in the Congo and the experiences of you know, the, the tensions involved in creating mental models and about how you can retool these things with paper, but how it's very fragile. But she goes into quite depth 
quite a lot of depth about the um, the sort of the, the care that they've had to put into the pen and paper one. And because it is quite an international uh, paper, I think people might be keen on that. I can pop that in the uh, um, in the chat. But other than that, I'm available for any particular questions on Network Canvas. Though I don't want to be <laughs> interloping in the the session. It's really your session and. Some of these papers, especially that most recent one there, is really what I think should take the spotlight. Thank you very much, Bernie, and uh, for whetting our appetite about Network Canvas. And also, please do put that um, other paper in the chat that you mentioned by Patricia, because I think many people will be interested in that. And I can certainly echo what you've said about the assumed professionalism of using, I have gone to interview highly skilled migrants with my pen and paper sociograms, and some of them were absolutely horrified that I was coming with pencil and paper. They thought, is this a childish game? Whereas others absolutely loved it and found it very creative and freeing. So I can certainly see it from both sides. I'm very conscious of time. Um, we are now at half past, so our time has officially ended. Um, I can see many people have had to go and they've been putting lots of complimentary uh, comments in the chat as they go. If there are any other final, very quick remarks that anybody would like to make, any final questions that anybody's burning to, um, to, um, to share with us, now is your moment, so please go ahead. Uh, my colleague Anna has been putting lots of interesting links in the chat as well, if anybody is interested in um, in other events that we're organising. And also, this event is being recorded and the recording will be available on the Centre website in due course. And so if anybody is interested in listening back or in sharing the recording with their students or colleagues, then you can do that um, as soon as it's put on the Centre website. I'll let people know. Uh, Bernie has now posted in the chat the link to that article he mentioned by Patricia um, about uh, her research in the Congo using pen and paper methods of uh, social network mapping. If there aren't any other questions, then maybe I can hand back to Janine just to do a, a final wrapping up. Janine. Thanks. Well, I, I think I will not wrap up anything. I just will. I will wrap up a big thank you, <laughs> a kind of a flower thank you for everyone. So many thanks for your participation. And again, many thanks for your contribution to the special issue, but also many thanks to all those who, who've who been here. I mean, I know it's after long working days, so we're really honored that you stayed with us, so many people until this point of the, the afternoon, basically. And uh, do you also want to say goodbye, Louise? Or yes, yes. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Janine. Um, it's been it was a wonderful experience working on this special issue. Um, one of the speakers mentioned that this all started at a fantastic workshop that you hosted in Neuchâtel in Switzerland at, at that beautiful university in Neuchâtel, and uh, it's it's just been a wonderful experience from then right through. The the colleagues were great to work with. The journal was really supportive to work with. And, and this has been a great culmination now, having such a great seminar this evening. I know it might have been better face to face over a glass of wine, but then we probably wouldn't have had such an international audience of, of over 70 people in attendance. So there are advantages to having these online seminars as well. So without delaying you any more from getting to your well-deserved dinner, I'd like to thank you all very much. A special thank you to my colleague at London Metropolitan University, Anna, who's been providing great support and has typed all the links to all the papers in the chat. So thank you, Anna. And uh, we look forward to future events where we talk some more about the ever fascinating social networks and migration. So thank you very much, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.